sorry. <laughs> hey, move, move over a little and I'll just twist that. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Glendetta tore up her fan, so. Somebody else did. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's great, good to see you today. Uh, just remember this week with July the 4th, the office will be closed uh, on Thursday um, as we uh, take time to remember the 4th. Um, the flowers today are in memory of Clarence Gwynn, given by Peggy Gwynn, and we are grateful for these flowers, but also reminding us of the beauty of Clarence and what he meant to this church and meant to you, Peggy. I'm grateful. You can look at all the other announcements which are here. Uh, the 150th is meeting after church today back in the fellowship hall. I look forward to seeing you back there. In July, we will not have any Bible studies on Wednesday night. be taking a break from that. Uh, the Women on Mission luncheon is July the 14th following worship. And look at the um, other things that are going on. Uh, on our prayer list, uh, birthdays of uh, Elizabeth Faircloth and Bobby Ward, uh, and anniversary for Joyce and Grady Adams. So, happy anniversary to them. Is there anything else we need to be made aware of this morning? Wanted to let you know about Miss Dorothy Tatum. She's been in the hospital this week, and they have um, found out what is wrong with her, and she's doing fine and is at home has an infection that they will be treating, so I want to be in prayer for Dorothy and Teresa and Faith as uh, Teresa and Faith care for her, so remember them in your prayers today. But I say this morning the most important thing, welcome to you. I'm glad that you all are here, glad that you've come to worship this morning, glad that we are here together. Um, we get to do it kind of early in the morning where the heat's not beating down on us and I know it has been hot lately but as we definitely play, pray for some rain and relief from that remember this uh, this Thursday on the 4th we are going to go to um, to watch a ball game now this is not the Fayetteville Woodpeckers and we have found out some more about this um, I found out that it's a U.S. Olympic are not the U.S. Olympic team, but the United States Collegiate team. But they're basically having an inter-squad scrimmage. So uh, we're excited. That I'm excited to be going to see that. Uh, about three or four of my volunteers are going to be on that team. There's a couple of folks from state. I think there's a couple of folks from Carolina. Um, so if you want to come, who is anybody planning on going with us? I know Danny is. All right. Good deal. Tickets are about... Huh? At the, the, what time? The gates open at 5.30. The game starts at 6.30. One of the main reasons we're going is because Mark will be jumping into the stadium that night. So Mark's going to jump into the stadium and uh, we're excited to be watching that. <laughs> I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, uh, time okay. on target is 5.30. So you'll, you'll probably need to be there by 5, five o'clock-ish. Okay. We just go up there. Pardon? We just well, if you want to go, let me know, because we really do kind of need to order tickets and get them, and we can get them and we'll let you pay us back. But give me a call uh, or give Kay a call tomorrow at the office uh, to <coughs> let me know, and the names that I have, we will set those as firm. So, okay, just let Kay know tomorrow. All right, anyone else? All right, this morning as we're here together, let's stand and welcome one another as the peace of Christ be with you.
All right, let us join our hearts together as we come together to worship. Jay's giving me the signal to pull out. We're ready to go. So <laughs> let's join together in our call to worship. With friends and strangers, with family and neighbors, we gather. With faith reaching out to touch, with heart straining to trust, we hope. With word and wonder, with silence and song, we wait. Come among us, dry our tears, to lift us to our feet to follow you. I invite you to stand as we sing our first song this morning. It's Raise a Hallelujah. If you remember last week, we were supposed to sing this at the end. This week, we're singing it at the beginning, so let's sing together. a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah 
Join me as we pray together. Be seated, please. Lord God of the universe, you alone are worthy of our hallelujahs. For you alone, O God, have led us to this point. Through the messiness of our relationship with you, O God, in those days which we look away, and then there are those days which we look to you. You alone, O God, have been faithful to us, guiding us each step, leading us, in your path. O God, may we focus upon that to which we are called. May we focus upon the sharing of love, the sharing of ourselves that is the true worship of you, that is our true praises that we sing. As we share life, Through your words, we share hope in actions. We share grace in our relationships, O God. May we look back and see nothing except the forgiveness which you have blessed us with. And may we set in our presence, O God, and sing hallelujah. For you have brought us here. And in the presence of our enemies, now, O oh God, you are and always have been and always will be with us. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing hymn 631, We Utter Our Cry. Let's stand as we sing. This morning as we enter into our time of confession, I invite you to pray where you are to confess yourselves to God. And then we will join together and read these words. Let's take a moment in silence as we pray.
Let's join our hearts together as we pray. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts so that we are able to admit to You the fullness of our lives. That which is beautiful and good and that which is hurtful and hateful. We confess that we do not follow Jesus in all that we do. We love with condition. We judge and condemn. We cast the first stone and keep the logs in our own eyes. We do not turn to You as the source of our healing. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive our sin and empower us to be imitators of Christ in love and service. Amen. Pray with me, please. Father, we wonder why moving forward seems to be so hard. And it is not due to You, O oh God, to keep us where we are. But it's our own failing to follow. Our own desire to stay where we are. Our own choice to build foundations that keep our feet stuck in the sand. When things do not go as we would like, O oh God, we look to blame. We look to someone else, O oh God, to blame them. When bad things happen, we always look to find it to be someone else's fault. And yes, O oh God, there are times when those things happen and we immediately sometimes beat our own selves down and we reject Your grace. God, sometimes there is a cause for the things that happen to us and around us. And sometimes, oh God, they are events that are unnamed. They are events that are designed to help straighten our path and draw us closer to You. And sometimes, O oh God, we must admit that things happen. No cause, no rhyme, no reason, O oh God. But we come before You today, O oh God, to quit looking to blame. To stop judging those who do not do as we desire them to do. And we come today looking to You. For, O oh God, in our sin, our greatest sin is our complacence to move forward into the kingdom that You have created, that You call us to, that You beckon us to, that You desire all to come to, to know love, grace, peace, and mercy. So, O oh God, this day we get on our knees, bowing to You, and together we proclaim Your eternal prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I'm going to make a small change today in our scripture text. It's going to come from the book of 2 Samuel. We're going to be be reading verse 1, and then we're going to be reading verses 17 through our chapter 1, verse 1, and then just reading that and then going to verses 17 through 27. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. Verse 17. David took up his lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and ordered the men of Judah be taught this lament of the vow. It is written in the book of Jeshar. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Least the daughters of the Philistines be glad. Least the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O mountains of Gilboa, May you have neither dew nor rain nor fields that yield offerings of grain. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled. The shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and gracious. And in death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. You loved me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would hope that we would find it strange and peculiar that David would grieve Saul. It's no surprise at his grief for Jonathan, whom he loved with such a great love. But for Saul, that's strange. Grief is a strange thing. He really at this point would probably be thinking that David would be jumping up and down. Saul is dead and now Israel can move forward with her anointed king. It's time that we move forward. And again, we would expect that grief for Jonathan, but not such a grief that would be shouted all over Israel. Now for Saul, words were appropriate. He was Israel's king. In some ways, a champion for them. But also a man of complexity and difficult to understand. And I guess this probably goes to show more than anything how messed up we are as human beings. How complex and messy relationships that we have in our lives every day, how difficult they are. And sometimes we really can't admit it. We love and enjoy the simplicity of saying this or that. Black 
or white. Yes, no. I like it. I hate it. We love the simplicity of that. But our relationships, our lives, are not that way. And we have to admit it. We would love for the Scriptures to be so easy to understand that we say, this is what it says. But in reality, Scriptures, the text, are complex. Difficult to understand. On one hand, in the Old Testament, it will tell you Avenge. But then on the other hand, it tells you to, in the New Testament, to turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. What in the world are we supposed to do? Then I reflected back on my teenage years. For our teenagers and those that are walking out today, for Alex even even back there, there are going to be times when we really we we don't like our parents. We we really didn't like our parents. Let's admit it. Sometimes those relationships were reconciled, sometimes they were not. They're difficult and complicated. And they get more complicated the older we get. Having been a child and a parent, I really kind of suspect it's because we really enjoyed the simplicity when our little ones were little. When they would skin their knee and they would come to us. When we would get home from work, they would come and hug our necks or even go play hide and seek when you walked through the door. We love those simpler times. Simple's fun. Simple's easy. But they get more complex. I guess maybe go see Inside Out 2 if you need explanation on that. But our relationships and the complexity that they are. And David sits here and explains that. Instead of finding joy for Israel... He expresses great sadness, even over Saul. Let's look at that relationship. When they first met, Saul had already been rejected as king of Israel. David alludes to that in this lament with the oil not being on the shield a poetic way of saying he had lost the favor of his anointing of God. And Saul messed up a lot. We know that. He would walk before God in battle, wouldn't fully listen to God, lived in fear of his men that he led and what they would do if he didn't do what they said. And that isn't unlike a lot of. We struggle with fear and what to do and should I do this and if I make them unhappy, what's going to happen? If I choose their happiness over their happiness, what's going to happen? And we lose that. And Saul was like, not unlike any of us in that point in time. But he had lost God's favor to lead. But God didn't immediately remove him from the kingship from his leadership position. He left him in play. Maybe hoping that he could find some reconciliation with that relationship and who he was. But it was never to come. For God had already showed David someone that even us as we read the Scripture would go, You've got all these and you choose the youngest. Maybe it was a sign that we had to wait. That Israel had to wait for their new king. So that he would be molded and grow 
stronger in the Lord and not come with all the baggage that comes with us sometimes as we get to be older. And Saul, well, when he first met David, he loved him. Remember the story of Saul seeing these evil forces and David would play the liar and soothe him. Saul loved David. Saul was grateful for David until he heard the cries of Israel. Saul who killed his thousands and David who killed his ten thousands. And then Saul laid into his humanity and began to be paranoid of David and what may happen. David continued to become a great leader in Israel and Saul was jealous, continually jealous of David. Even trying to kill him later on. And David, on two occasions at least, circling the camps of Saul and sparing his life, Somewhere deep in him and within his soul, there was a remembrance of the love that Saul had for him. There was a love of Saul because of David's love for Jonathan. And so there was something that stopped David from fulfilling his human desire and listening to God. Relationships are messy. We don't know why. It's just part of our humanity, part of who we were made and how we were made. But our relationships are messy. There are possibly a hundred reasons why David would have done this. And it's some lessons that we can take from this. I think I have said to you before, but if I have not, one thing that disturbs me and worries me the most about myself is when I look at an individual and I judge them for the things they have done. And I think in my mind and in my heart, that person is worthless. Such a grievous sin I commit in those moments. It's hard to look at another human being that is alive on this earth and think they're a they are worthless, that there's no hope in them for what they can do. Some of us feel that about other human beings. Some of us feel that about ourselves. Today, I will tell you that there is no human being that is worthless. Even those that struggle the most, that demand the most from us, the most attention, they are not worthless. They provide worth in drawing our attention to needs, to help, to be present in people's lives, in the lives of people that we even may have hate for. They call us and remind us that Christ lived so that we could learn to pour ourselves in to those that struggle. You know, the lepers, the cripple beside the pool, the woman at the well, the woman that grabbed the hem of his garment. Society had cast them out and said they are not worthy And Christ Himself taught us they are. 
They are a person of worth. Now one thing I will tell you is to give your self grace on some things. Because if someone is trying to kill you, and I don't say this in jest, to kill you, to harm you, it is okay to hold them at arm's length. It is okay to protect yourself. It is not okay to give up on that relationship. To continue to at least pray for that relationship. And pray that they find that the Lord in His goodness finds a way to help reconcile that. But it is okay to protect yourself and please do. I have been in relationships like that and in truth there are people and I've joked with some of you that there are people that I dare not mention their name. You know, kind of like Baltimore and Harry Potter. But there are people that our relationships were very damaged and broken. Pray that maybe God can find a way to reconcile those relationships but I really don't and struggle with welcoming them in their presence in my life ever because of the damage that was done. It shows you the complexity of our relationships and how they are. People that abuse and harm and destroy, we have to protect ourselves. David also probably did this for the good of others. What good is it to drag a man down after his death? Some in the nation, some in Judah may have loved Saul the way that we read about those that love David. And for the goodness of the nation of Judah, David called them to healing in their grief. Grief sometimes, grief is good for healing. When people pass from us or leave us, do not neglect your grief ever. It will be to your detriment. Admit what they mean to you in your life. Recognize it. Cherish it. And learn to cherish those memories. Because loss is difficult. But be honest about that relationship. David was. David was very honest about his relationship with Saul. Remember, he really was so mad that he wanted to kill him. And he didn't twice. Be honest with yourself about the anger that you feel sometimes the frustration in relationships. And my prayer is, is that those things that disturb you, that keep relationships being made whole, that we learn to deal with them. But our biggest problem is our distrust of another. You may go to somebody who you feel has wronged you and say, I feel you have done something to me that has hurt me. And you give them that opportunity to double down. Or you're afraid they will. That's a real fear. So when we pray for one another, we need to pray that we, that we are ready and they are ready to be honest. But at least be honest with yourselves and understand how you have been hurt. These are just beginnings of dealing with relationship and learning how to heal them, how to make them whole. Because human relationships are a messy, messy thing, are they not? 
And so the best thing I think we can do as a community in learning from David and his willingness to share his grief even in the midst of those of those that he loved dearly in Jonathan, but those that he had the most complex of relationships in Saul, we must first begin with everyone is a person of worth. And if we begin there, I pray that God can make our relationships whole and full for all the days that we are on this earth. Amen? Amen. I invite you this day to stand as we prepare to sing our invitation and invite you to join me in prayer. Blessings to you on the rest of this day. And I hope you have a safe and wonderful 4th of July as we celebrate on Thursday. If you would like to go to the baseball game, remember, give Kay a call tomorrow here at the church to let us know. Um, And make sure you remind me today because I think we had three people that said they were going to go. But it's great to see you today. Happy 4th of July and have a great rest of the day. Join me as we pray together. God of great grace and mercy, you have been here with us. For in the spirit of each of us, we carry a part of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may in our lives, as we deal with the messiness of our relationships, may in all things, may we look to you and see the face of your Son, Jesus, who calls us to hope, grace, and love. In Christ's name we pray.